Dearly beloved, here lies the soul of the Super Team era. We knew ye by many names. The 2011-2014 Miami Heat. The 2016-2019 Golden State Warriors. The 2017-2018 OKC Thunder. What? What do you mean we ain't counting them? The 2015-2017 Cleveland Cavaliers. Many other fake ones in between. Oh, and finally the 2024 Phoenix Suns. Um. Nothing else to say. It's been real, it's been fun, but it ain't been real fun. Rest in piss. If you're watching this video, it means our beloved Phoenix Suns had that premature heat death I alluded to in our NBA playoff prelude. And while everyone and their mom probably already has made a video about this team's failures, I just had to make a video too, because there are so many interesting things to talk about. So if you enjoy this content, like and subscribe, comment down below what you think the Suns' next step is, and let's get into the video. Welcome to the sweatshop. Part 1, The Official Death of Super Teams to me, to be classified as a super team, you have to have two defining characteristics. One, you gotta have at least two All-NBA players and one All-Star. And two, you can't be organically made. You have to be manufactured. What does that last one mean? Well, I define a manufactured team as a team where at least two of the star players were signed or traded for. I think this is what differentiates regular stacked rosters like the 2024 Boston Celtics from actual super teams. Actual super teams have this grimy feeling that's hard to describe. It feels like they're taking a shortcut, like they're cheating. No Tristan Thompson, on or off court. It's this Cali Tate that typically makes these super teams the overarching villains of an NBA season's narrative. This threat of becoming the league's new villains was usually enough to deter a super team's creation. That is until three men came together, pause, and collectively told the entirety of NBA fandom, We do not care. It's weird to me that whenever you ask an NBA fan who the first actual NBA super team was, they will almost assuredly say the Heatles. When the big three Boston Celtics, a team who completely encompasses both of the characteristics I discussed earlier, came together a whole three years before them. But then I thought about it and came to the realization that I myself don't really consider the big three Boston Celtics a super team. They were certainly stacked enough, don't get me wrong, with two to three all NBA level players still in their primes and one to two all-star level players depending on how you feel about Rajon Rondo. P.S. He's one of my favorite players of all time. But they didn't or don't feel manufactured to me. Primarily because it was the GMs doing the tinkering and not the players. I don't even know if KG knew he was going to the Celtics until the trade happened. Despite the fact that the Celtics traded for two of their four stars in the same offseason, they were still kind of brought together. They still felt somewhat organic. The Miami Heat on the other hand though? No, they were the dictionary definition of manufactured. The first one really. And if not the first, then definitely the most publicized. And I think it's the fact that it was maybe the first time that players came together to form a stacked roster and the fact that it ended up working out a couple times that ends up overshadowing why the Heatles actually worked. So many of us looked at the Heat's roster, looked at the faces, looked at the names, looked at the collective all-star games and all NBA appearances, just the sheer amount of star power on that squad and said that team is going to win. And I don't want to just shit on us NBA fans because I'm 100% sure that the players forming these super teams thought that as well. Hey, we all top 10 players. If the three of us get on the same team, it'd be over for the rest of the league. Hence the one championship. Not two. LeBron, tell us about that. Not two, not three. No, no, a touch too far. You had it right at two. But look at the teams Miami lost to. The Dallas Mavericks with just Dirk. The San Antonio Spurs with a geriatric Timmy D and prepubescent Kawhi Leonard. Who'd the other most famous super team, the death lineup Golden State Warriors, end up losing to? Kawhi Leonard and... In fact, if CP3 doesn't get injured, I believe the Rockets would have beaten them in 2018, a team that only had Harden and Chris Paul as the all-NBA level players. How did these two stacked teams, with a total of seven Hall of Famers in their primes, lose three collective NBA Finals to teams that had a maximum of one Hall of Famer in their prime? It's really simple. It's because basketball is not arithmetic. Part 2 
IRL NBA 2K. Throughout this super team era, 99% of us in the basketball universe had an NBA philosophy that boiled down to literal addition. Oh my goodness, the KD, Russ, and Harden big three would have been so good. KD's a 95 overall, Russ is a 94, James is a 95. You combine that with a couple 78-ish overalls and you'd have a 88 overall starting lineup. There's no way anyone could stop that. <laughs> Just assuming that you put three random superstars together, surround them with average role players, and then everyone plays their best, and your team goes 16-0 in the playoffs to win the championship. And do not think I am talking shit on anyone. That little KD, Russ, and Harden example I was talking about was pretty much an exact one-to-one -one rendition of something I probably said when I was young and dumb. Dumber. There was a point in time up until like 2017 where I had the 2k rating of 95% of the NBA memorized down to the attributes and determined how good teams were in the game and in real life based on how many 90, 80, and 70 overalls they had on their roster. But as I've grown older and wiser, I've realized something along with a lot of other people. I'm not trying to act like I'm Socrates or something, but I've realized that basketball is not addition. Not addition with numbers at least. It's addition with Venn diagrams. For the following discussion to make the most sense, please try to forget that KD, Russ, and James Harden played together when they were much younger players and not fully formed. Imagine that when people are talking about the OKC Big Three, they're trying to put together the 2016 versions of KD, Russ, and Harden. On the screen, we have a circle that will function as the basis of our OKC Big 3. This circle represents the skills of the head of our Big 3, Prime Kevin Durant, the elite shot creation, the mid-range, the defense, etc. Now let's add his former partner in crime to the screen and all his skills. Russell Westbrook's excellent shot creation, his playmaking, his ball handling, the hustle. As you can see, there's a little bit of overlap, but still they are, and were, a very good match. Russ is the energy of the team, he can create shots for himself and others when KD's off the court. KD can carry the offense with his shot creation when Russ is off the court, but when they are both on the court, Russ can play make and KD can be the primary scorer. Okay, this is good. Add in James Harden and they should be unstoppable now, right? His playmaking, ball handling, on-ball shot creation, three-point shooting, almost completely overlaps with Russ. You see what I mean? Sure, with this hypothetical big three, you're adding together three people that are all elite in their own right. But when you put them together, because of the overlaps in their play style, you aren't getting all of the skills that makes each of them great. If Russ, KD, and Harden are all on the court together, and Russ is playmaking, you aren't going to be able to use all of KD's elite shot creation, just his scoring and defense, which are both still elite, so that's not bad. But if Russ is playmaking and KD is scoring, what is James doing? He can't play make two without taking away from Russ. He can't create his own shot when Russ or KD have the ball, so he's just spacing the floor? That's not what makes James Harden great. You might as well just get Kyle Korver instead. He's a better spot-up shooter, actually moves well off ball, and most importantly, He's cheaper. What happens if we switch James and Russ's roles? James is the playmaker, KD is the scorer and defender, and Russ is... what? Well, we've actually seen this on the Rockets and even more so on the Lakers. Unless you want to play Russ at the 5, which may work offensively but will bring up a host of issues defensively, what you're going to get is an inefficient hustle neck that defends pretty well and is the energy of the team. If that's the case, you might as well get Marcus Smart, Dylan Brooks. He's a better defender, more efficient, and again, cheaper. 99.99% of super teams do not work out, not because the stars choke or something like that. These super teams fail because they are constructed based off the premise of just shoving players together, based solely off their names and not what they're going to look like when they are together. Often for these star players to fit together, they'll have to completely switch their play styles. Best case scenario, your star players are able to switch their play styles and still be stars. This is why the Warriors and Heatles ended up working out in the end. On the Heatles, Braun, Wade, and Bob were all interior scorers and not much else their first year, which allowed the Mavs to pack the paint and almost fully neutralize Miami's offense in the NBA Finals. That second year though, Ron added a post game, Bosch became a stretch five, and all three stars became elite off-ball shot creators. The death lineup warriors already fit pretty well when they first started, but over the course of the season, they became more and more comfortable fitting into the Warriors system. For a more current example, I would say the 2024 Los Angeles Clippers. Harden as the playmaker, 
RPG as an off-ball mover, floor spacer and occasional shot creator, Kawhi as your primary scorer, and Russ as your sixth man. Those are all the best case scenarios though. Worst case and most probable scenario, your star players switch their playstyles to fit together and in the course of doing that, one or more of them become role players, which in turn means you are now paying star player money for role player production. That brings us to the 2024 Phoenix, Arizona Suns, a team who doesn't pass my Venn diagram test at all because all three players are essentially the same, just slightly worse or better versions of each other. A team where all three of the stars are elite on-ball shot creators, solid playmakers, off-ball creators, and defenders, but not elite at any of those. A team where all three players are injury prone to some degree, and a team with a coach who I think is just slightly above average overall. This was doomed from the start. And despite Vegas inexplicably having this team as one of the favorites in the West throughout the season, and the sweatshops saying they'd beat the Timberwolves in seven despite correctly saying in the beginning of the season this team would fail, I feel like a good 70% of the basketball community already knew this. I'm fairly certain a majority of NBA fandom outside of Phoenix did not trust the Suns. So I'm not going to talk any more about why the team failed, because quite frankly, you probably already knew everything I discussed up to now in the video. Instead, I would like to discuss the Suns' exit plan. How are they going to improve this team? Or if they don't think they can improve this team, how can they get out of this mess? They can't. Part 2. The Suns are hopelessly with no lubrication. These Suns are not going to get better, and even if they tried, they cannot actively get worse. This is the team for the next few years at least. Why is that? That's because, my dear friend, of the new Collective Bargaining Agreement, or CBA, passed a little over a year ago. Now, I won't go into the details of everything the new CBA entails, but there is one thing it establishes that we must go over. Before we do, go ahead and like and subscribe. I know you, I see you haven't done that yet. Just go ahead and do it real quick. Comment down below what you think of the video so far. But the one thing we have to go over the second apron. The second apron is a salary level established in the new CBA that NBA teams are not allowed to go over. It's around $180 million, so NBA teams are not allowed to have a roster whose collective salary exceeds that number, and if they do, then they are hit with a host of crippling penalties. Now, why is that important? Well, just because the Suns' big three that they've invested essentially all their draft capital in is going to make a collective $150 million next next year, which fun fact is more than the salary of 15 NBA teams. So even if the Suns cut everyone except their big three or traded everyone but their big three for draft capital, somehow incurred no penalties and signed a bunch of minimum players to fill out the rest of their roster, they'd still be threatening to exceed the first apron of $170. And while the penalties for that aren't as severe as the penalties for the second apron, they still make it very difficult to trade and sign players. And that is the best case scenario. Worst case and most probable scenario, all of or close to all of the Suns projected $205 million total salary cap for the 2024-25 season is still on the books and they are disciplined with the full power of the new CBA. What will this disciplining include? Well, let's say the Suns want to run it back with an improved roster. They are severely over the salary cap so they can't sign any free agents with their own money, but if they use the mid-level exception, they should be able to sign a solid veteran role player. Second apron teams will no longer be allowed to use the taxpayer mid-level exception. Okay? Okay. What if they want to package together a bunch of their lower level role players like Josh Akogi, David Roddy, etc., to get a mid level role player that's maybe on a suboptimal contract? Or maybe package Yusuf and Grayson Allen to get a really good defensive center? Second apron teams cannot add together multiple players in a trade to acquire a player of higher salary. P.S. That's like 90% of trades. Oh! Okay, what if they just want to trade some cash for players? I remember the Bulls did that with Jordan Bell and the Warriors got a solid rotational piece out of it. Second apron teams can no longer use cash in trades. Geez, fine, let's just trade Beal. I don't know why we got him in the first place. He's got the worst contract in the league. So I guess that means they'll have to attach a pick to him. Because of the new CBA and the long established Stepien rule, the Phoenix Suns can't trade any picks. Oh, and Bradley Beal has a no trade clause. You're toast. Like it or not, this Suns team is the team that Phoenix fans will be stuck with for the foreseeable future, unless the Suns want to trade Booker or KD. And if I'm being honest, with this new CBA, I don't know how much teams will be willing to give up for Booker and KD. It's one thing to pay your own star players a third of your own salary cap, it's another thing to deplete your roster of multiple valuable assets just to get a guy that you would then have to pay a third of your salary. And none of this would matter, it would all be completely fine to just run this back if the Suns were at least competitive in the Timberwolves series. 
Sure, it's the first round, but the top six to seven seeds of the West are pretty much all on the same level. If the Suns lost to the T-Wolves in six or seven, you can convince yourself, hey, this is their first year together. They didn't have home court advantage. It took the Wolves seven games to beat them, so they're at least in the mix in the West. Let's run it back. I bet they can do better next year. No, you got swept. You are not on the Timberwolves level at all. Nowhere close. And there is a very real possibility that the Timberwolves could be the fifth best team in the conference. I personally think they're third or maybe second but if someone said the top contenders in the west went in order nuggets some combination of thunder clippers mavs and then timberwolves you couldn't really argue it at this stage in the playoffs hell i don't even think the suns are better than the lakers the lakers at least took a game off of someone who i think is better than the timberwolves so no matter what way you slice it the suns are cooked they aren't good enough to contend they have almost no means of improving and they are too restricted by the new cba to effectively rebuild they are toast and you know what it serves them right i sincerely hope that this slow death of this team will coincide with the end of the super team era as a whole and teams and players alike will look at the 2024 phoenix suns tombstone as a warning a sign telling you that microwaving a contender does not work anymore and really, aside from three to four instances in the entire history of the NBA, it has never worked before. Maybe this failed super team is finally enough to show that the draft, smart free agency pickups, quality trades, and consistent improvement is and has always been the ideal way to create a champion. With that, thank you for watching this video all the way through. You did not have to, and I appreciate you a lot for that. If you enjoyed this content, like and subscribe. Comment down below what you thought of the video, what you think the Suns are going to do next, if you think maybe they'll improve somewhat in the near future. I don't know. And I, I forgot to do it these last few videos. As always, stay sweaty, ladies and gentlemen.